a copious amount of lemon pledge. Most of the broken glass and food droppings have been swept from the floor. The TV was off, and all the giants were standing against the far wall in a line. Their hair combed, their ties straightened, their shirts tucked in. In unison, they chanted, Good afternoon, Miss Samira. Alex curtsied. The real Samira said, Good afternoon, uh, class. My lady Samira is too overwhelmed to speak, but she is very happy to be here. Alex brayed like a donkey. The giants glanced uncertainly at Thringa for etiquette tips. King Thrym frowned. He put on a black tux jacket with a pink carnation pinned to the lapel, which made him look slightly more elegantly ugly. Why does my bride sound like a donkey? She is crying with joy, Sam said quickly, because she has finally seen her handsome husband. Hmm. Thrym ran a finger down his many chins. That makes sense. Come, sweet Samira. Sit by me and we will begin the feast. Alex took the chair next to Thrym's throne. Thringa flanked her brother like a bodyguard, so Sam and I stood on the other side of Alex and tried to look official. Our job to consider this with not eating, swatting aside the occasional mead mug that accidentally flew in Alex's direction, and listening to our stomachs growl. The first course was nachos. What was it with giants and nachos? Thringa kept grinning at me and eyeing the Skothman's sword, which was still strapped to my back. It was clear that she coveted the blade. I wondered if anyone told her it couldn't be drawn in the presence of women. I assume giantesses counted as women. I didn't know what would happen if somebody tried to us Skofnung despite its restrictions, but I doubted it would be good. Try it, Jack's voice hummed in my mind like he was having a pleasant dream. Oh man, she's so fine. Go back to sleep, Jack, I told him. The giants laughed and shoveled down nachos, though they kept one eye on Thringa as if making sure she wasn't going to smash them with a bar stool for bad behavior. Otis and Martin stood in their harnesses right where we'd left them. Occasionally, a stray train flew in their direction, and one of the goats would snatch it out of the air. Thrym did his best to chat up Alex. She shied away and said nothing. Just to be polite, she snuck an occasional tortilla chip under her veil. She eats so little, Thrym worried. Is she all right? Oh, yes, yes, Sam said. She's too excited to have much of an appetite, your majesty. Hmm, Thrym shrugged. Well, at least I know she isn't Thor. Of course not. Sam's voice went up an octave. Why would you think that? Ages ago, when Thor's hammer was first stolen by my grandfather... Our grandfather, Ringa corrected, examining the ridges on her lucky chestnut. Thor came disguised in a wedding dress to get it back. Thrym's wet lips curled inward like he was trying to locate his back teeth. I remember that day, though I was only a child. A false bride ate an entire ox and drank two cases of mead. Three cases, Thringa said. Thor could hide his body in a wedding dress, Thrym said, but he could not hide his appetite. The giant smiled at Alex. But don't worry, Samira, my love. I know you are not a god. I am smarter than my grandfather was. Thrym filled her huge eyes. It's my city that keeps out the Acer, brother. No god could pass through our doors without triggering the alarms. Yes, yes, Thrym said. At any rate, Samira, you were all magically scanned the moment you came in. You are, as you should be, a child of Loki. He knit his eyebrows. Although, so is your maid of honor. We're related, said Sam. That's to be expected, as Lando's relative often serves as maid of honor. Thrym nodded. That's true. At any rate, this wedding is concluded. The House of Thrym shall regain its former stature. My grandfather's failure will be put to rest. We will have a marriage alliance with the House of Loki. He pounded his chest, causing his large belly to ripple and no doubt drowning entire nations of bacteria in his gut. I will finally have my revenge. Thringa turned her head, muttering, I will have my revenge. What's that, sister? Grim demanded. Nothing. She bared her black teeth. Let's have the second course, shall we? The second course was burgers. That really wasn't fair. This felt so good, my stomach rolled back and forth, throwing a temper tantrum. I tried to distract myself by thinking of the fight to come. Thrym seemed dumb enough. Maybe we could actually beat him. Fortunately, he was backed up by several dozen Earth Giants and his sister, he made. I could tell Thrym had her own agenda. Though she tried to conceal it, every once in a while she would glance at Alex with murderous hatred. I remembered something Heimdall had overheard her say. They should just kill the bride as soon as she died. I wondered how long it would take the Acer to get it once the hammer was revealed, and whether I could keep Alex alive for that long. I wondered where Loki was, and Uncle Randolph. Finally, we
the giants finish their meal, Scrim belt and turned to his bride to be. At last, the time for the ceremony, he said. Shall we be on our way? My gut clenched. On our way? What do you mean? Scrim chuckled. Well, we're not doing the ceremony here. That would be rude. The entire wedding party is not present. The king rose and faced the wall opposite the bar. The giants scrambled out of the way, moving their tables and chairs. Thrym thrust out his hand. The wall cracked open, and a new tunnel wormed its way through the earth. The sour, damp air from within reminded me of something I couldn't quite place. Something bad. No. Sam sounded as if her throat were closing up. No, we can't go there. But we can't have a wedding without the father of the bride. Thrym announced cheerfully. Come, my friends. My bride and I will say our vows in the cavern of Loki. Chapter 50. A little refreshing poison in your face, sir? I really hate jigsaw puzzles. Did I ever mention that? I especially hate it when I stare at a piece for hours, wondering where it goes, and somebody else comes along, slaps it into place, and says, They're stupid. That's what I felt like when I finally figured out Loki's plan. I remembered the map strewn across Uncle Randolph's desk when Alex and I had visited. Maybe in the back of my mind, I'd realized how strange that was at the time. Randolph's quest to find the Sword of Summer was over. Why would he still be poring over maps? But I hadn't asked Alex or myself about it. I'd been too distracted. Now I was willing to bet Randolph had been studying topographical maps of New England, comparing them with ancient Norse charts and legends. He'd been ordered to undertake a different search, to find the coordinates of Loki's cavern in relation to the Buttress of Thrym. If anyone could do it, my uncle could. That's why Loki had kept him alive. No wonder Loki and Randolph were at the bar. They were waiting for us at the other end of the tunnel. We need our goats, I yelled. I waited through the crowd until I reached our chariot. I grabbed Otis's face and pressed my forehead against his. Testing, I whispered. Is this going on? Thor, can you hear me? You have beautiful eyes, Otis told me. Thor, I said. Red alert! They're taking us to Loki's cave. I, I don't know where that is. The tunnel is on the right-hand wall, angling down. Just... Find us! Otis, did he get the- What? Said Otis asked dreamily. Magnus Case! The giant king yelled. Are you ready? Uh, yeah! I called back. We just have to ride in the chariot because... Traditional wedding reasons. The other giant shrugged and nodded as if this made perfect sense to them. Only Thringa looked suspicious. I feared she was starting to doubt that the chariot was a rental. Suddenly, the bar felt much too small, with all the giants putting on their hats, straightening their ties, swigging the last of their mead, and trying to figure out their places in the wedding procession. Samir and Alex made their way to it. What do we do? Alex hissed. I don't know, Sam said. Where's our map? We're going to be in the wrong place, I said. How will they find us? It was all we had time to say to one another before Thrym came over and took the reins of our goats. He pulled our chariot into the tunnel, his sister by his side of the giants filing in two by two behind us. As soon as the last giants were inside the tunnel, the entrance behind us sealed shut. Hey, Thrym! My voice bore an unfortunate resemblance to Mickey Mouse's, making me wonder what sort of strange gases were in this tunnel. You sure it's a good idea to trust Loki? I mean, wasn't it his idea to sneak Thor into your grandfather's wedding? Didn't he help Thor kill your family? The giant king stopped so abruptly, Marvin ran into him. I knew I was asking a polite question, especially on the guy's wedding day, but I was grasping for anything that might slow down the parade. Thrym turned, his eyes like wet pink diamonds in the gloom. Don't you think I know that, human? Loki is a trickster. It is his nature. But Thor is the one who killed my grandfather, my father, my mother, my entire family. Except for me, Thringa muttered. In the darkness, she glowed faintly. Several apparitions. I hadn't noticed that. Giants could turn off and on. Thrym ignored her. This marriage alliance is Loki's way of apologizing, don't you see? He realizes now that the gods were always his enemies. He regrets betraying my grandfather. We will combine our forces, take over Midgard, and then storm the city of the gods itself. Behind us, the giants let loose a deafening cheer. Humans! Shut it! Thringa yelled. We have humans with us!
Gretel up for just one and that then they would eat her Hansel could do nothing about it and then the day came to eat Gretel I think we'll the woman said a little rose may some salt and we'll put it even for three or four hours then her meat will be hotter and I began to sweat then a delicious smell wafted to his nostrils oh no he thought I'm cooking. He sniffed at the air. And I smell delicious. But he wasn't cooking. It was just the remainder of a leg of goose that he'd hidden in his chest pocket from last night's dinner and had forgotten to eat before he fell asleep. It was so hot in the oven that the skin was crinkling. The baker woman smelled it too. She came down and opened the oven door. Are you cooking yet? She asked. But Hansel shook his head and took another bite of the goose leg. The baker woman frowned and closed the oven door. I probably should have said yes, he thought. Oh, well. He finished off the goose leg and continued to sweat. Soon another delicious smell rose to his nostrils. Oh, no, he thought. Now I'm cooking for certain. He sniffed at the air. And I said delicious. But he wasn't cooking. It was three strips of bacon that he tucked into his socks at breakfast. It was so hot in the oven that the fat was sizzling and popping. The baker woman smelled it too. She came down and opened the door. Are you cooking yet? He asked. But Hansel shook his head and ate a second strip of bacon. The baker woman frowned and closed the door. I probably should have said yes, he thought. Oh, well. Hansel finished the bacon and continued to sweat. Soon, yet another delicious smell rose to his nostrils. Oh, no, he thought. I must be cooking now, and I smell delicious, just like chocolate cake. This time, he was right. He was cooking, and he did smell just like chocolate cake, because he had eaten so much of it, listening to the baker woman's house. The baker woman smelled him cooking, came downstairs, they opened the oven. Are you cooking yet? She asked. But Hansel shook his head. I don't think it's hot in here. I shrugged. That smell was just some chocolate cake I had stuck in my undies. Not hot enough in there, the baker woman huffed. Let me see. She crawled into the oven, pushing Hansel out of the way. Feels plenty hot to me, she said. Hansel had crawled out of the oven while the baker woman was crawling in. He looked at her, pink and sweating, sitting in the enormous oven. Hey, she shouted at him. What are you doing? Something dim flickered in his food-addled brain. I'm saving myself and my sister, he said, from another terrible parent. And then he closed and locked the oven door. Hey, let me out. Baker woman shouted at him. Hey, you stupid little kid, let me out. Hansel stared through the grate on the oven door at her. The baker woman began to sweat more. Her face was burning. I'm sorry, she cried. I'm sorry for what I've done. I don't want to die. Just let me out. Let me out. 
consoles face off and please I could die in here I could die Hansel began to feel sorry for her but he certainly wasn't going to let her out he walked up the stairs and up to the house where he found Gretel sitting in the dirty cage are you hungry he asked she looked up dinner's in the oven he added but Gretel wasn't hungry and besides he was only kidding. The end. Now that's not a bad little story. But it is a crime. A crime that that is the only part of Hansel and Grab's story that anybody knows. Yeah, yeah, nearly getting even by animalistic baker woman is bad. But not nearly as bad as what's to come. Speaking of which. The little kids might have liked that one. Or at least, they probably could have sat through it without screaming their hands off. In fact, if any little kids heard that story, that's just fine. Hi, little kids. But things get much worse from here on. So why don't you go hire a babysitter and let's do the rest of this thing alone. The Seven Swallows once upon a time, a man lived with his wife and seven sons in a cozy little hut in the middle of a small village. The sons were strong and good, and the wife was kind and loving. You would think it would be a very happy family, and for the most part, you would think right. But the father wasn't quite as happy as he could have been. You see, he wished for a more than anything in the world. But since he and his wife had tried for one seven times, and failed each time, he was now resigned never to get his wish. Imagine his surprise then, when one evening a boy and a girl knocked on his door and asked if they could come and live with him. They explained that they were away from two different homes together. One, where their parents had cut off their heads, and the other where a wicked woman had tried to eat them. The man nodded at them like you nod at crazy people. But, they said, when they saw this cozy little house, the center of the village, with the light flickering in every window, that it was a better house for a family than either a palace or a cake house, and that any parents who lived inside would probably love them and not try to hurt them. So they had decided that they would like to live there for the rest of their days, if that was okay, with the man and his wife. Well, the man was delighted. Maybe their heads really had been cut off. So what? Who cared? He breathlessly ushered in Hansel and Gretel, for that's who they were, of course, and told his wife to prepare them dinner. Then he ran to tell his seven sons to go to the town well for water for the bath. Who's taking a bath? The oldest one asked. Your new brother and sister, the father shouted with joy. Now hurry. The boys were puzzled by this, certainly. But they knew their father had a terrible temper when he was angry and were afraid to displease him. So together they hoisted the great wooden tub onto their shoulders and ran to the well. The man's wife laid a steaming plate of boiled meat and potatoes before the children. Dreadle hesitated. Will we have to do chores if we live here with you? She asked. The woman was kind but firm when she said, You will. And go to school? Of course, the woman scolded. Good. Gretel thanked the woman for the food, and she and Hansel, slowly and not at all greedily, began to eat. Meanwhile, the father wondered where his new children's bath could be. But the seven brothers, in their haste not to displease their father, had lost their grip on the tub and sent it tumbling to the well. He'll be furious, the eldest whispered, while the youngest cried, He'll be us for certain. They crowded around the well, wondering what they should do. At home, their father was getting more impatient by the minute. Where are those foolish boys? He whispered to his wife. 
as she worked in the kitchen. Our new daughter and son will be wanting their bath at any moment. When, a short time later, the boys still were not home, the man swore and said, They are useless. I wish they would all just turn to birds to buy way. At that very moment, in the village, the seven boys turned into seven swallows and wheeled into the evening air. They flew past their house's kitchen window before disappearing into the nearby wood. The woman saw this and turned on her husband in a fury. But he said it was all for the best and that they had always wanted a daughter more anyway. And he made her promise never to tell their new children what had happened. For he said, what good could come of their knowing? Reluctantly and with tears in her eyes, his wife agreed. At first things were fine in the cozy little house. Hansel and Gretel's new parents were very kind and always took this especially good care of Gretel. But the children soon began to worry. The new father was happy, but their mother seemed to bear a great sadness with her wherever she went. Gretel in particular loved her new mother very much. She could not stand to see her so upset. Tell me, mother, she would say. Tell me what's wrong. But always her mother would pretend to laugh and shoo her away. There were other strange things that Hansel and Gretel began to notice. Their room had seven beds in it. And once they asked their new parents what these seven beds were for. Their parents told them it had been a guest room before Hansel and Gretel had come to live there. Gretel didn't believe them. Who has seven guests all at once and makes them sleep in the same room? Gretel wondered aloud. Hansel was less worried. Once he came upon their new father, he had the seven empty beds in their room with the hanging from the end of his nose. But he didn't know what to make of it. Besides, he was happy to be in the place where your father wouldn't cut off your head and your mother wouldn't try to eat you. But Gretel grew more and more comfortable living there. She heard whisperings about the town. Oh, nice children, yes, but such a sacrifice. All seven sons at once. And she wanted more and more about their new mother's sadness. In time, one of the children told Gretel the whole story, and a few other children, wide-eyed, earnest, confirmed it. Everyone in a little town knows everything about everybody. We can't live here anymore, she lured her brother that night. It's our fault that the boys were turned into swallows. We must do something. Hansel was devastated. Aren't there any good parents in all the wide world? He muttered. It's my fault, Gretel said, for the child told her how badly the father wanted a daughter. Did it because of me? She turned to Hansel. We must find them. Who? The swallows. How are we going to find seven little birds out there? He said, and gestured at the window of their room. The gesture was so weak and small that it made it there seem utterly unconquerable. Gretel didn't know, but she did know that they had to try. Otherwise, her heart would be guilt. Hansel didn't think they had any hope of finding them, but he had suddenly begun to worry that this father would wish him into a so too. So he agreed to go and try. When the night was heavy and the new parents were asleep, Hansel and Gretel slipped out into darkness to find the seven swallows. They walked all night. All the next day. And all the next day. I still don't know how to find them. Hansel sighed. Gretel said. As the sun came up the next morning, dazzling their eyes, Gretel said, I know. The sun. She sees us everywhere we go. She must know what happened to the seven swallow boys. Let's ask her. Hansel thought she was crazy. On the other hand, he didn't have any bad ideas. So Hansel and Gretel climbed the tallest tree they could find until they were right up near the sun. 
tried to speak, but she was still terrible. They had bad faces. Hansel tugged on Gretel. She children. Hansel whispered. Gretel thought was probably right. They climbed back down the tree and started walking again. That evening, as the moon rose above the trees, Gretel said, The moon sees us just as much as the sun, and he's not so hot and terrible. Let's go and ask him. So they climbed the tallest tree and got as near as they dared to the moon. The moon wasn't hot and terrible. Instead, he was cold and creepy. Be by full fish. I think I smell child flesh, he said. Hansel and Gretel hurried to the tree as quickly as they could. As the moon did say, how oh, I get the moon ate the eater. I said, so go in the original room, and I looked up. It stared and dejected. Hansel and Gretel walked until they came to a beautiful lake that shimmered in the starlight. We've been walking forever, Hansel said. We'll never find them. Let's give up. But Gretel's guilt was bubbling like a boiling pot inside her. It's my fault that our new mother's sons have disappeared. Gretel moaned. She began to weep. And her tears fell into the shimmering lake. When they landed, they shook the reflection of the stars on the water, waking them from their living sleep. Oh, tears have woken us, the stars asked. At first, Hansel and Gretel were scared. Did stars eat children too? The shining star seemed far nicer than the blistering sun or the creepy moon. So told the stars all the troubles. We've seen the sad and swallows fling, the star said. They live in the crystal mountain. You can save them, but it will take great courage and sacrifice. The mountain is months of hard travel from here. If you decide to go, take this chicken bone with you. It will open the door to the mountain and let the seven swallows out. Just then, the children noticed a chicken bone beneath the surface of the water at the edge of the pool. Hansel did not want to go. Months, he bleated. But Gretel said, please, Hansel. And she grabbed his arm and held it tight. At first, Hansel resisted. But once he saw that his sister would not change her mind, and that he was losing feeling in his arm, he reluctantly agreed to go. So Gretel put the chicken bone in her pocket, and the two children journeyed for a month and a day, and then another, and then another. They passed through dark forests and sunny fields, blazing deserts and muck-filled swamps. They grew much during their travels and became strong and lean for hardship and perseverance. Gretel carried her smoldering guilt with her always, but it was bearable, so long as she knew the feelings about it. Finally, they came to a massive mountain range and proceeded through the whipping snow. The peaks of the mountains rose up white and sharp all around them, like the craggy of some stone beast. Above, the sky was pale and clear. Oh, so cold. Their cheeks became red and shut. Their eyes flew with frostbite. Hansel wanted to turn back, but Greg did not let him. At days and days of climbing, they finally arrived at the crystal mountain. It was tremendous. The most wonderful thing they had ever seen. Its crystalline crags rose straight up from the ice and snow that lay at its feet. Around its peaks, screaming to the skies. It's beautiful, Hansel murmured. Gretel nodded wordly. As he said, I couldn't have gone any far. Before them was an enormous door made of ice, with a keyhole just about the width of a finger or a chicken bone. Gretel reached into her pocket. She found nothing. She reached on farther. And farther, and farther, until she felt the cold alpine air 
Swirling around one of her fingers. She had a hole in her pocket. She had lost the bone. They looked all around for it. When did you last have it? Hansel asked. Last night, the night before? But Gretel couldn't remember. And she became more and more afraid. Soon she collapsed on the ground and sobbed until her little body nearly broke. All these months, she wept, for nothing. What I've taken you through. And I've failed our new mother. Hansel wrapped Gretel up in her traveling cloaks. And as the night came on, lay down beside her to sleep. But Gretel could not sleep. After many an hour, her tears subsided. But still, she could only think of her failure. Her guilt burned her like a scouring wind. And then the stars came out and reminded her of her failure again. And she felt so guilty, so foolish, so worthless, that she could not even look at them. Near daybreak, she looked down the long path that she and Hansel had trod. They would have to go back now having accomplished nothing. Months and months more of suffering. And all the while, her guilt would throb inside of her. Suddenly, Gretel ran to the door of the Crystal Mountain and began to bang with all her might, pleading to be let in. She banged so hard, in fact, that she cut herself on a shard of ice. She woke her sleeping brother, who offered to tend to her wound, but she refused. I'd rather make it worse, she said. She picked up a sliver of ice, as sharp as a knife, and brought it down on her middle finger, severing it from her hand. Hansel stared, aghast. Gretel's face was white, and her voice trembled when she said, Now I can make things right. She was bleeding swiftly from where the finger used to be, but she stood and walked, resolute and grim, to the door of the mountain picked up the finger, slid it into the keyhole, and turned it. The door opened. I'm sorry. I wish I could have skipped this part. I really do. Gretel, cutting off her own finger and putting it into a keyhole? If there was any question about the truth of this part of the story, I would have left it altogether. Maybe she could have found another chicken bone. Or maybe if she wished hard enough and said so, a magic word, the door could have opened on its own. But there's no doubt about the finger. Besides, if I left it out, you'd be wondering why Gretel had only nine fingers at the end of this book. Which reminds me of another question you're probably asking. Why did the door open? I don't know. A finger is enough like a chicken bone, I guess. Why a chicken bone even in the first place? Again, I don't know. I have no idea why either a chicken bone or a finger should open the Crystal Mountain. As for the location of the Crystal Mountain, that's quite clear. And if you have any interest, I'd be happy to share with you. Just write me. Now, I've got to say something about cutting off one's own finger, in case any young children are still reading or hearing this tale, which would be almost beyond belief, given all of the tales that have happened so far. Cutting off your finger, my young friends, is about the stupidest thing you can do. Don't do it. You won't be able to do anything with your finger. Only Gretel. I've already told you I don't know what may have been to do to sacrifice. The door swung open. A storm of brown wings, the children backed onto the snow, and seven swallows swirled out of the mountain. They settled on the ground, their black eyes studying Hansel and Gretel curiously. It didn't work, Gretel said incredulously, her bleeding hand really beginning to hurt. Hans watched the swallow mutely around on the white snow. He didn't know what to say. They were still birds wanted to cry. After a few moments of painful, confused silence, Gretel bound beside the smallest swallow. It's time to go home, little bird, she said. Your mother misses you. The swallow held her in its black gaze. 
Hansel thought back to the boy's father, and suddenly he remembered a tear hanging from the end of his nose. Your father misses you too, he told them. Suddenly, the claws on the swallow's feet off, and their thin bags began to lengthen and grow thick. Wings stretched outward until fingers appeared at their ends. Then there were wrists, elbows, shoulders, and all the rest. The swallow's black eyes paled. Their feathers turned to hair and clothes. And finally, a circle on Hansel and Gretel stood the seven brothers. He misses us? The littlest one asked. Hansel and Gretel, amazed by the transformation, dumbly. The boys began to rejoice. And after a fit of hugging and laughing and cheering, the eldest turned to Hansel and Gretel and invited them to the Christmas. Jumped when she noticed in the wood of the tree 
what appeared to be a woman's face. It was made of bark, with brown hair wrapping around its smooth cheeks and wide eyes. Gretel walked up to it, mesmerized. What a magnificent tree, she said. Thank you, the tree replied. Now, you might have expected Gretel to jump, or Hansel to fall backward over a conveniently placed log, but neither did. The tree's voice was so gentle that neither the child was startled at all. Welcome to my wood, she went on. It is called the Leibenwald, the wood of life. 